This morning as we begin, as always, one of the best ways, if not the best way there is, if you would give your attention to the baptistry this morning, that's John Jones, who you know, and somewhere down there, <laughs> you weren't supposed to see the Ohio State jersey, no, I'm just kidding, that's Holden Bartow, and we're very excited to witness Holden being baptized this morning. Awesome. Uh, church, this is Holden, as Lincoln just said. Um, Holden is 10 years old, and I've had the pleasure of watching him grow up. Um, his mom was baptized in this baptistry just a few years ago. It was a beautiful evening. And now Holden has made a decision, too. Holden goes to Whitesburg Christian School, and they have been talking about following the Lord. And so Holden's decided that he wanted to follow Christ, and we've been talking about what that looks like. So, Holden, would you tell everybody what it is you love about Jesus? I love how he always takes care of me and always feel, makes me feel comforted. Thanks, buddy. And if you know anything about the life of this family, that is definitely the witness God has definitely been taking care of you guys. So hold on, I'm gonna ask you probably the most important question anybody will ask you your whole life. And I know that you're gonna answer, and I know that there's a lot that you still have yet to learn about what it means to be a disciple and follow and keep your promise to him. But you know what? Today, there's going to be angels rejoicing around the throne room of God. Because you, little man, are making a stand for him. We, we learned from Timothy. He was encouraged, not much older than you, to not let anyone look down on him. Because he was young, but to set an example for the believers in speech and in hope, and in love, and in purity. Are you ready to do that for us? Yes. Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Holden? Yes. Yeah? You want to love him your whole life? Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right, buddy. Now I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we've been talking about, now, 
you get not just the Holy Spirit, but you get everlasting life. That is so cool. So plug up that nose. We don't want the water to go up your nose. All right, are you ready? What an incredible way to start the morning. We are glad you are here. Uh, glad you have come to be a part of this service this morning to uh, praise God with us as we lift our, our voices in praise. Uh, hopefully you received a bulletin on the way in. There's a lot of good information in there. Uh, attendance cards were, uh, I think, in the bulletins or on the back of the chairs in front of you. There is a side for guests and members. If you'll just take a moment and fill one of those out or respond electronically on your handheld device to let us know you're here. Uh, the good thing about those cards is there's a spot uh, for prayer request. If there's something that you would like the, uh, the ministers and the elders of this church to pray over, uh, please put that on there and you can turn those in when they pass the contribution plates a little bit later. We're excited this morning to have Scott Sager back with us. Scott is the uh, Vice President for Church Services at Lipscomb University. Uh, spoke uh, about a month, month and a half ago, and, and we are glad to have him back with us this morning. We recently had a starting point class for new members, and this morning I wanted to introduce uh, those families uh, that have joined and have them stand uh, briefly and just let you get to see them if they're here this morning. I always warn them that we're going to do this, and I fear that when we say that, that they might not show up. Um, not everyone likes to stand. But let me introduce them to you, and you can see them. Uh, first slide. Lee and Nancy Jackson and their three sons, Whit, Sam, and Pete, uh, right here in the back, have been members here before, moved to, uh, moved to Florence for about a year. They're back in town, and we're glad to have them back with us. Tim and Lori Schrode and their children, Riley and Madison, And Grant and Jessica Warfield. Oh, they're right there in the back also. So uh, take time to welcome them and let them and, and love up on them uh, as they're the new members of our family. And I'm going to ask now if you'll just all stand and greet one another, and then Lincoln will continue uh, leading us in worship in just a minute. To us a child of hope is born, to us a son is given. Him shall the tribes of earth obey, him all the hosts of heaven. Him shall the tribes of earth obey, him all the hosts of heaven. His name shall be the Prince of Peace, forevermore adored. The Wonderful, the Counselor, the Great and Mighty Lord. The Wonderful, the Counselor, the Great and Mighty Lord. His power increasing still shall spread, His reign no one shall know. Justice shall guard his throne above, and peace abound below. Justice shall guard his throne above, and peace abound below. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. And the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoiced 
rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, the angel voices, O oh, night divine, O oh, night, when Christ was born, O oh, night divine, O oh, night, O oh, night divine. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Christ is the Lord, oh praise his name forever, his power and glory evermore proclaim. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the new birth that we witnessed right now in Christ. We pray that you may be with this young man throughout his life and show him what pleases you. Fill him with your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. And we pray that we as a congregation may uphold this young man and help him to grow more in the grace and favor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for all the grace that you bestow on us and for the fervent work of your Son on our behalf. Forgive us when we simply expect all these good things without noticing them what they mean or what you're doing, we're thanking you. You're so good and your grace is so complete. Open our eyes and our ears and our heart to what you're doing and what you truly want from us as our Father. Thank you for giving us the life and sacrifice of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, and it's his name we pray, amen. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent Him from your side.
to walk upon this guilty son and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God, who oh, watch me in His precious blood, my, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of Let's pray. God, what a journey. For thousands of years they waited. And we beheld. 
two faithful parents in the great unknown, a baby born your son. We celebrate it, but in reflection, it has no power without that baby becoming a man, a man that would go to the cross, a man that would die, your son, a baby, a man. This morning we remember God revealed to us in the form of Jesus, and we offer thanks and we celebrate as we share in this feast of his body in the taking of this bread. And we ask your blessings on us as we do that and on others as we share that. In his name we pray, amen. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side, to be led by your staff and rod, and to be called a Lamb of God, O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God. Christ the Lamb of God. Lord, we behold the man on the cross bleeding on our behalf, blood that washes us, blood that cleanses us, blood that makes us also lambs of God. And we offer our eternal greatness as we consider the words and the themes of these songs and this message this morning, we ask that through the sacrifice of Jesus, we would be at peace knowing that you have come to the world and revealed yourself. And because of that, we have a chance of being with you. Bless us as we remember that through the taking of this juice. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
God, cover me, cover me, cover me, peace of God, cover me, through the storm, cover me. of God, cover me, cover me, cover me, peace of God, cover me, through the storm, cover me. Only in you I find peace, so cover me. Only in you I am safe. Only in you I'm secure. Only in you I find peace, so cover me. Let the peace that passes all I understand Cover me when I am hurting Cover me when I'm not strong Cover me when I am going through the storm Cover me when all seems hopeless Cover me when my faith is gone Let the peace that passes all I understand Cover me when I am hurting, cover me when I'm not strong, cover me when I am going through the storm. Cover me when all seems hopeless, cover me when my faith is gone, let the peace that passes all I understand. Cover me. of God cover me through the storm cover me let's stand together it came upon the midnight clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. Peace on the earth, good will to men from hands of gracious King. The world in some stillness may to hear the angels sing. Be seated. Come on. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to be with you today. My name is Scott Sager. I'm from Lipscomb. Honored to be with you. Delighted that finals are over. And uh, we had commencement yesterday, and I came down this morning. So good to be with you all today. And uh, I hope that uh, the day is a blessing to you. It's already been one to me. I got to meet with the elders early this morning for breakfast. We had my kind of breakfast. We had eggs. We had grits. We had tomatoes. It was, what was it called? Gibson's? Barbecue. So I, I now have been introduced to the greatness right in your community. So it's, uh, it's good to be with you. But I'm excited about what God's doing here at this church and so thankful to be a part of it uh, today. I think that Christmas really hinges upon two prophecies that came to Isaiah um, 800 years, 750 almost 800 years before Christ uh, was born. 
If you have your Bibles, look in Isaiah chapter 7 for this prophecy. It says there, Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you will call His name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then from chapter 9, just flip the page. Look in verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has appeared. This morning I want to talk to you about appearance. The word there is epiphany. It's a manifestation. It's a showing up. It's... It's something that happens in this context when God breaks in to the world. And a lot of people think long and hard about their appearance and how they will show up. I have a friend named Milton Jones, and he told me about one day he was at a Texas Tech football game, and he was one of the uh, wranglers for the Texas Tech football team. And all of a sudden, right before halftime, they got a phone call, and Bob Hope, a comedian was flying over in his airplane headed back to California and he noticed that the football game was going on and he asked if he could land and just run out on midfield and and wave at everybody. And so they said, sure. And so Bob Hope landed and drove over to the stadium and said hi to everybody and then got back on his plane, went on his way. The other day in Nashville, there was a family that was having their Christmas cards made when all of a sudden Taylor Swift was jogging by. And she decided to photobomb their Christmas card. And so they invited her over and she, was, uh, she posed for some pictures. But it was one of those things that was just totally unplanned. Do you think Christ came into the world in a totally unplanned way? No. There was a lot of thought that went behind it. This past week, you may have heard the President of the United States came to Nashville and Lipscomb got to help host his, his gathering there and some of our students I got to pose questions to him. But when the president is coming, there's a lot of thought that goes into that. A planning of the route that he's going to take. There was a seal that was put on the podium. Hail to the chief is played, and in walks the president, and it's all orchestrated. Or when the Academy Awards happen, people think long and hard about the dress that they're going to wear. The limo ride, the pull up to the front door, the red carpet treatment. It's all part of the process. Before our favorite football team runs onto the field. The fight song's played. The cheerleaders are there. It's all set for a grand appearance. And so I want us to think about Christmas for a minute and think about the way that God orchestrated the appearance of His Son. You see, better than any fight song or hail to the chief were the angels that sang in an open field to shepherds. Better than any limo ride was the donkey ride that took Mary into Bethlehem. Better than any red carpet was a feeding trough and swaddling clothes, the rags, Better than any dress worn at the Academy Awards was what was put upon Christ. But that story, that entrance into the world is so amazing because it's totally backwards from the way we would have done it. I mean, just to put it in context, if I told you that the Savior of the world was born today behind Gibson's barbecue in a garage, and if you wanted to go there today, you could find the baby lying in an old towel in a spare tire sitting in the back of the garage. That would be what this story is trying to tell us. That's how God enters into our world. And I want us to back up for just a minute, and I want us to realize that there are five gifts of God's appearing to us through Christ that I think we need to celebrate today. And I brought little bags, little ornaments that go with each one of these so we could think about it. Because, you know, the first way that God appeared to us, this ornament has the sun, moon, and the stars upon it. I'm going to hang it right here. 
But the first way that God appears to us is in His creation. I still remember the day that my wife said, Honey, I think it's time for us to have a baby. And I was like, What? Us? Have a baby? Really? I started thinking about it. And I was thinking, We're dinks. You know what a dink is? Dink is double income, no kids. I thought, We're double income, no kids. Can we afford to have a baby? Are we ready for that? And we began to think about it, and we began to realize, of course we're not ready for it, and of course we can't afford it, but we really want it, because we want to share life together. We want someone that we can love unconditionally, that we can welcome into our world, and let them be a part of it. Can you imagine what it was like the day that God the Father looked at God the Son, Genesis 1.26, and said, let us create mankind in our image. Male and female, let's create them. Let's love them unconditionally. What a step for them to take. A perfect heaven with angels to do their bidding, and now they want to risk it all out of unconditional love to create us. But not yet just to create us, but to put us in a beautiful context. To create this wonderful world in which we can live. In Romans, Paul says that from the beginning, the creation of the world has screamed that there's a God. One of the songs that's sung at Christmas is Breath of Heaven. It was the breath of heaven that spoke and the world was created. It was the breath of heaven that spoke And the stars and the sun appeared in the sky. It was the breath of heaven that spoke. And the animals and the plants, the duck-billed platypus and the roar of the lion, the giraffe with the long neck and the zebra with the funny stripes. God spoke and they all were created. And if you're like me, you love creation all year long, but there's something about this time of year. The Christmas trees and the lights, the carols and the smells, the great food that's all part of this. But don't you see, if you love all the sights and sounds, the creation, you got to love the Creator who gave it all to us. And so the first way that God appears to us is He appears to us in His creation. And as His creation, we could say, and that's enough. God, you owed us nothing else. You created us and you gave us this world. But God said, no, that's not enough. That's not enough. So the God who spoke and everything was created became the breath of heaven that entered into our world in the manger. And so the second gift, this is one of my wife's favorites. It's a little manger scene. But the second gift of God appearing is when God appeared to the Virgin Mary and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And she says, what's going on? He said, God is going to grant salvation to the world through you. Name this baby Jesus. And so she did. And into this world, our world, appeared the one who created our world. The creator becomes part of his creation. He writes himself into the story. The virgin was with child. And God was among us. And we can call him mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. And so God appears in the manger. To identify with us. You see, why would God allow His Son to be born in such a circumstance? I remember when our first uh, child was born. You know, we went to the classes to learn how to have a healthy birth. And then, you know, it was June the 9th when my daughter was born. 
And I remember trying to figure out how to get the car carrier, the baby carrier in the car the right way, you know. And I'm sweating profusely and we're working just to get everything right. And then, of course, we're leaving the hospital and my wife has this elaborate outfit for our daughter. It's smocked and it has all of this stuff on it and little booties and all that. And then my, my mother-in-law had made this a beautiful quilt, and so she's got all this on, she's wrapped in this beautiful quilt, and we're going out to the car, and the, Anna starts crying, my daughter. And Suzanne said, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? And the nurse looked and said, well, that baby's probably hot. It's 100 degrees outside, and you've got about four layers of, yeah. but we had all these clothes that somebody had given us that we wanted to put on our child. Well, when Jesus enters into this world, He's not born in a hospital. He's not born with a doctor. He's not put in a nice gown. Nobody weighs him and measures him. There's no nurse looking on. When he is born, we're talking about sheep and goats are there to welcome him. We're talking about placing him in a rag and putting him in a feeding trough that has dried slobber all over the side of it. And you're asking yourself, what is God doing? He's saying, when I appear as one of you, I am appearing in such a way as that all of you can identify with me. That I am one that is for everyone. And what we know about Jesus is that he came into our world and he showed us how to live. He showed us how to love. He taught us what it means to walk in the footsteps of God. But then the one who spoke and created the world, the one who wrote himself into the creation, the creator writing himself into the story, he then decides to pay the ultimate price for us and to go to the cross. I remember a certain Christmas and it was uh, one of those years where I asked for something really big for Christmas. Any of you guys asking for something big for Christmas this year? Anybody going to admit it? Are y'all too old to ask for stuff for Christmas? Are you? Because I did. I mean, I was like, you know, go big or go home. So I... Uh, I remember asking for a set of golf clubs, and Christmas morning came, and we all came running in, and there were no golf clubs under the tree, and I tried to hide my disappointment and wondered if maybe if Santa couldn't provide, maybe my parents would, but we made it through all of Christmas, and everything unwrapped, and there's paper all over the floor, and there's bows, and all of that, and now we're getting the bags out, and we're beginning to collect the trash, put the bows in a box, and all of a sudden my dad said, hey Scott, what is that? And he he pointed, inside the Christmas tree there was this little note, and it said, Scott, you've been good this year, go look behind the piano in the playroom, signed Santa. And I dropped everything, and I went running out to the playroom, and I looked behind the piano, and guess what was there? Golf clubs and some balls. And I've never forgot that Christmas because it was the gift that came when I thought Christmas was over. And if you think about that Sunday morning, it's the resurrection, the third appearance of Jesus that is the gift that came when all the disciples thought the story was over. And when they thought there was no more to this story, Christ appeared again from a tomb to remind us that it's empty. And so I brought this um, ornament along. It's one of my favorites. It's, it's red and it's blue for the body, blood, of Christ, waters of baptism. But you can see, you can see all the way through it because it's empty. And what we're reminded about the resurrection is that the one who created everything, who wrote himself into our story, and who showed us how to live, 
also showed us that death was not the final enemy. That there is a God who is greater than even death. And you know what that means for me? It means that one day, I'll see my grandparents again. Christmas has never been the same since they left us. It means my mom will see her dad who died when she was 13. This is the part of the Christmas story that tells us, promises us, that the Christmas story doesn't end at the manger. But it speaks about an empty tomb. And that Christ appeared again and said, even death... I am victorious over. And so you're wondering, well, what other gifts could there possibly be? We sing a song, some of us who are older, called, uh, I Cherish the Old Rugged Cross. Remember that one? And the reason that we cherish the old rugged cross is because the cross bore the Savior who bore the sins of the world. Think about that with me for a minute. We cherish the old rugged cross because the cross bore the Savior who bore the sins of the world. But before the cross did, Mary did. You see, that's why Mary is important to this Christmas story. Because she bore the Savior who bore the sins of the world. There was a day... When the angels appeared to Mary and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And she said, How can this be? And they said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will give birth to a child. So that the one that is born to you will be called the Son of God. But I'm a virgin, she replied. And the angel looked at her and said, Nothing is impossible with God. And she said, May it be to me according to your word. Now pay attention. At our baptism, like we saw this morning, what we proclaim is that what physically happened to Mary spiritually happens to us. She bore the Savior who bore the sins of the world. Christ lived in her. In Colossians 2, Paul says, this is the mystery of the ages that has been hidden from others but now has been revealed to you. What is this mystery? Christ in you. The hope of glory. So what's the fourth appearance of Christ? It's the appearance of Christ in the hearts of mankind who have been baptized into his name. If you've been baptized with Christ, you have been clothed with Christ. And Christ comes, as the song says, let every heart prepare him room. And Christ comes to live inside of us. And so we have this fourth ornament, a heart, to remind us of the gift that comes through our baptism with Christ who now abides in our heart. The appearance in creation, the appearance in the manger, the appearance in the empty tomb, the appearance in the hearts of mankind. But there's one more gift, and it's a little bit different from every other. Around your house, is there anybody who just has to guess what's in the packages? They have to pick them up, and they have to shake them, and rattle them, and try to figure out what's going on. My little brother would cheat He would get up in the middle of the night and he would uh, sneak in there and try to open his packages and find out, 
uh, what he was getting. There's this sense of anticipation. There's this sense of just wanting to know. And what I think we need to know is that there's one more gift. And it's wrapped a little bit differently because we have to treat it a little bit differently. Do you want to come help me for a minute? Do you mind? Yeah, uh come on up here. Is that okay? I'm going to let you do something. Sit right here next to me. Right here, right here. What's your name? Bailey. Bailey, I'm Scott. Pleased to meet you. Thanks for helping me. So he's going to buy you an ice cream cone for doing this. Is that all right? Okay. Well, um, in the book of Revelation, it tells us that this guy named John had an apocalypse. Do you know what an apocalypse is? It's a vision where he gets to see things that no one else got to see. And then he, he tells the rest of us what's coming, okay? And so this is, this is like a gift that we can't open yet. Does that make sense? So I want you to shake it and tell me what you think is inside. Yeah. Any guesses yet? You want to smell it? What do you think is inside? An ornament. An ornament. I think you're right. You know, the danger of being in Huntsville with all you engineers is that you're really smart. <laughs> what kind of ornament? You want to guess? A baby. A baby? That, that might be a good guess. But I think. Let's, let's let you, like an apocalypse, we're going to let you peek. And then if you want to, you can tell everybody else what you see. Is that fair? So all of us, we get to shake it. We get to listen to it. We get to anticipate it. But you see, we don't get to open it yet. But there's a few people who get to peek inside and kind of tell us, what is it? Can you see what that is? You want to tell everybody or you want to just keep it a secret? You're going to tell them? Okay, speak loud so my mic will pick it up. What do you, what do you see in there? It's an angel. With what? Did you see that other part? What's that right there? A an angel with a trumpet. Thank you, Bailey. You can go sit back down right in there. This is the appearance that's still to come. It's the one that we anticipate. It's the one that's before us. It's the one that we remind each other of when we gather together to worship. It's the one that says this world is not our home, but Christ is coming again. And when He comes, He'll come in glory. He will come with the archangels and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then all of us who are still alive will go and meet Him in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. And there'll be a, ba a great banquet and a great celebration, and Christ will appear again. So Merry Christmas, this Christmas. Enjoy the appearance of God in the creation. Enjoy the appearance of God in the manger. Celebrate the fact that the one who came in the manger died on the cross and rose and the tomb is empty and there is victory over sin and death. And we will see those who have gone on before us who aren't with us anymore. And we do carry Christ in our heart through faith. And that presence of Christ in our heart does remind us I will not leave you as orphans, but I have gone to prepare a place for you. And if I have gone to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you that you might be where I am. One Christmas Eve, there was a minister who was having a Christmas Eve service. And in front of their church building was a nativity set, one of those big ones. And when he arrived for the Christmas Eve service, he went out to the nativity set and he looked in the manger, and you know what he saw? Nothing. Baby Jesus was gone. And so they had their Christmas Eve service, and when he got up to speak, he was just so frustrated. He said, church, I've just got to tell you, I am so frustrated with this world we live in, I just can't, i just got to say, somebody has stolen the baby Jesus from our nativity. There's just something wrong with that. And he tried to make a spiritual message out of it, but it was kind of a bummer for everybody, and really he should have left it to himself. But he was, he was having therapy from the pulpit, you know, which is always a bad idea. 
So after it was over, he was closing down the church. And all of a sudden, he looked up and he saw coming down the sidewalk a little boy named Johnny whistling a tune and pulling a shiny red wagon. And as Johnny got closer, he looked in the wagon. And he thought, it can't be. And yeah, Johnny pulled right up to the church. and He looked in the back of the wagon. He said, Johnny, how could you steal the baby Jesus from our nativity? And Johnny looked up and said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't steal him. What you need to know is that every day this month, ever since the, the, the nativity went up, I've come here every day and I've prayed and I've asked Jesus to give me a wagon for Christmas. And I promised him that if he gave me one, I'd let him have the first ride. <laughs> and so now I'm bringing him back. There will be people who miss what Christmas is all about. And there will be people who get it. Don't let anybody steal the Christ from your Christmas. But be grateful for all that he has done. And for the promise that the one who has done it all is coming back again to take us to be where he is. And if we can help you today, we're not in a hurry if you've not let Christ enter into your heart by baptism, that's so important. It's vital to the life that you long to live and to really celebrating what Christmas is about. But if the Grinch has stolen Christ from your heart, it's time to let him have his place again. Let us know how we can minister to you any way we can. Please come to the front as we stand and sing this song together. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit, to embrace you offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way oh you hopelessly lost the way you are the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for, oh, our hearts always hunger for, Almighty Infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, here in our weakness you find us, falling before your throne, oh, for your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger. seated please I know that we have been without a regular preacher for a number of months but you gotta say it's been a blessing in a way hasn't it amen, amen. Scott and today is no exception what a blessing to be here today thank you so very very much and just so you'll know Scott has agreed to come back and work with us on an interim basis after the first of the year 
He will be here three Sundays in January and two in February and two in March. And so we'll get a little continuity, but we'll also have the ability to, if we need to have some special other speakers come in, we can call him and tell him to stay home. So it's going to work out great for all of us. And we're really, really excited about that. And we appreciate uh, him and Lipscomb University for allowing him to be available to do that, as that is what he often does. So keep that in mind. Also this morning... Peak of the week, this Wednesday evening, all adult classes will meet in the fellowship hall for peak of the week. Come join us for coffee, dessert, praise, and a devotional thought this Wednesday. Christmas bears, I believe there's a stu- st- still a few left, and if you'd like to get one, we'd certainly like to give you that opportunity as we try to bless the children at the Child Haven Children's Home um, in Coleman. If you still have one, we'd really like to get that back so that we could send it to them. So if you still have one, please get it back by Wednesdays. A few of these lovely poinsettias that you see this morning are available for sale. If you'd like to pay for one, $10 each, you can take it home after next week's Christmas service with our kids. Today, the children's ministry will be Christmas caroling after worship. K through fifth graders are eating pizza and then go caroling. Again, pizza and caroling, what a combination. Parents are also welcome to attend. And uh, the other things, if you have questions, you can check with Amy on that. Next, have a meet downstairs in the fellowship hall, my wife said. Uh, The Twickenham Christmas service, next Sunday at 9 a.m., we will not have regular classes. We will meet in the fellowship hall for coffee and donuts, followed by our Christmas worship service with our kids, uh, leading that service next week at 10 o'clock, children's ministry. Uh, Come back and and join us for that. Financial peace class. Financial peace will be offered here on Wednesday nights starting in January. For more information, see your bulletin. Oh, and I forgot to mention next week, along with our kids program, my dad, John Smith, will be speaking to us. So that'll be good as well. Um, The week after that, what's, did something happen? Oh, I got you. It's a week after, did it say Earl Lavender? Yeah, that's two weeks. So he'll be here in two weeks. Um, Let's see. This morning, a couple of special things really quickly. Uh, Steve Owens and Tim Logan have just returned from Ecuador. And Steve's got just a couple minutes to share with us on some great stuff going on down there. And then Dan Beasley has just a couple things on our minister search after Steve. So Ecuador and then Dan. Quickly, Tim and I uh, had some time and went down there last week. He and I haven't been there in probably about a year and a half, and uh, personally, others have gone. And I just wanted to give you a quick update. We considered it the best trip we've ever been on. Had a lot of special time to spend with Justin and John Rieger and uh, Jake and Tanya Wilson, and it was just wonderful. We've got a lot of improvements that have gone on in their child care facilities and, and team, additional training for the house parents. We've got counseling sessions going on with the children as necessary improvements in the houses and it's all based on experience judgment with this kind of facility. We had a wonderful time each evening that we went into each home and sat down and had dinner with the with the house parents and the children and the first house parent started off with hey let's go around the table the children can speak enough English that uh, you can talk about your favorite color your favorite animal you know that kind of thing It was fun we had fun we laughed Uh, and but the other thing was you know what do you like doing and what do you want to be what do you want to grow up to be? Uh, and it was great. Uh, our children have some varying dreams of what they want to do. In fact, Christian, just that week, was uh, received word that he has been accepted into the AIM program, that's Adventures and Missions, I think, uh, in Brazil in March. So he's got some last-minute last high school paces to finish, and he'll be ready to start uh, one of our first and oldest children coming out, and I think he's going to be a great missionary from Latin America. So praise the Lord for that one. Uh, the changes in the school are also improving, and they're, and they're impacting the students. We, we're moving away from the, from the paces. We had a self-paced program that we put in place. Uh, it was very, very good for motivated students. It was not very good for less motivated students, as you might expect. And so we're moving, transitioning away from that uh, to a more traditional classroom. Jake and Tanya are, are moving it in that direction. And we're seeing immediate improvement in a lot of our students. Our kids are doing much better in school and having much better grades this year. So we're we're thankful for that. A lot of great teamwork down there, too. They are working hand-in-hand across all the folks that are down there. 
Kathy Jones DeFrancis, I think many of you all know her, has been down there for a number of years, still working in the school. In fact, you might see her sometimes. She's back in the States for a couple of weeks. Is she here? Don't see her, but she's, there she is, Kathy. Okay. Uh, Jason, her husband, is, is working in the school. He's taking care of all the chapel and teaching a class. He's working with the church youth. He has a bunch of energy. He's an amazing guy, and he's helping with outreach in the community and, and just doing a wonderful job. Now, you know, we, we just felt so good. Is everything perfect? No. Are there still some issues we see here and there? Absolutely. And there always will be. But the team that's down there is so much better prepared for any kind of varying behavioral issues and, and to be able to deal with it in a loving way. I'm just excited about the fact that they're prepared to do that no matter what comes, comes their way. We've had some struggles with budget as the, as the new team gets down there and tries to understand, particularly in the school costs, what's going on and trying to get that uh, understood completely. But you know, we got that behind us and the Lord's taking care of any of those issues. And uh, I know we'll have a hand to, handle on that in the future of the operations, and the future looks so bright. But most importantly, our children are loved, our children are learning, our children are being shown Jesus, and our children have dreams for the future. And that's something they didn't have before. So praise God for his hand in the HOH mission. Thank you. Uh, briefly, the Minister Search Committee uh, update and report to tell you a little bit about what's going on. We, uh, we have been busy and, and hard at work. The um, first process was to begin to, to gather names and uh, through University, uh, Lipscomb, uh, Abilene, Harding connections, we've been able to make some strong connections there and, and have people there aware and, and referring names. Uh, to us, the staff, uh, see, you see how much hard work they do on something like this, but Lincoln, Steve, and Shannon have gotten a website. Mike Thompson helped set a website a connection up so that names began trying to, to again, gather names. And, and importantly, we've had a lot of referrals from some of you, uh, people that maybe didn't send the name in, but the people that we ought to be targeting. So we set about to gather names, and gather names we did. We've, had, uh, we've got a list of over 30 people. Uh, people from far and wide. We've got, I started thinking, from 12 different states, from the Northwest, the Northeast, the Midwest, the Southwest, the Southeast, the Atlantic Coast. We've got, we've got candidates from throughout the United States that have uh, sent their, their information in, and very, very exciting candidates to me. We're very excited about what's, what we see, the interest uh, people have in Twickenham, a wide range of age, experience, styles. Uh, we have... Um, we have um, a, a diversity of, 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 of all kinds of individuals with great families, great ministers, exciting to see the ministers and what they're doing. It's energized the committee. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to look at this day and age. You know, there are blogs and there's websites and there's social media and there's YouTube. And so there's a ton of stuff. But the committee does their homework. They come in, they've looked at stuff, they found stuff, and they've, they've really uh, been a very active part in the process. So we're excited and we're eagerly anticipating this, this new chapter. Don't know exactly. We've been a, sort of at a 30,000 feet level looking at this thing and gathering names. Uh, we do uh, request you continue your prayers as we kind of, kind of get a closer look, start to zoom in a little bit and uh, begin to focus uh, on a fewer number of candidates. So we, we need your prayers. We ask you to pray for the committee. It's a deliberative process, and we need a, a, a spree de corps, and, and a, we need to be able to, to work together very closely. And we, at the same time, it's like a jury process. We need to deliberate. And so we need your prayers and ask you to, to uh, keep us in your prayers, keep the church in your prayers through this decision. And these families, these candidates, these individuals, this is obviously a, a critical decision uh, for uh, one or more of them to think through and to work through. Uh, but, but again, just um, we're excited, uh, very optimistic about what, uh, what we've come to to this point and uh, looking forward to the process. Also, Scott, we've had a lot of help from others outside, but Scott's been one of those people, Randy Harris, and a lot of good consultants along the way have been helpful. So. All right, anybody else want to make an announcement this morning? <laughs> Listen, let's stand together. And I know that um, 
Sometimes announcements make us forget about what we did, about what our walk should be like this week, about what Scott has shared with us. And so again, this morning, rather than a closing prayer, if you would give your attention to this closing thought, and let's refocus as we go out into the world this week. And may you bless it with others as you come into contact with them. Have a great day.